Okay, so um, next up is uh, the little walk through the, the talk I gave, as I said, two weeks ago, three weeks ago. So, uh, the Lugano workshop of the HPC Advisory Council. Um, I skipped the first part. Now, the bits and pieces, I will just refresh our brains what Docker is, our Linux containers are. Uh, left hand side traditional virtualization, right hand side continuization. And traditional virtualization, we have a hypervisor, and on top of the hypervisor, we have the same stuff we have underneath the hypervisor again, right? We have the kernel and the user land, which comprises the OS, and then we have the service we want to run. So the traditional virtualization in a very short nutshell. Uh, whereas in containers, we, we have the host kernel, the user land, and we do not have a hypervisor. We have the control daemon of Docker now, or mm -hmm. later we will have run C, so we don't have even the control daemon again anyway. Uh, and the containers, they talk to the same host kernel as the normal user land talks to, which is cool because, uh, for instance, if we have a two socket system with 12 cores each, in the left hand side, if the hypervisor is not very smart, and I think most of them aren't, they will hide the fact that it's two socket. They will provide 12 cores to with one socket to the kernels of the host of the guest systems, and the guest systems therefore cannot really make smart decisions about the placements of the of the threads. Right. So, in the right hand side, the kernel knows about everything. He knows about all the process groups that are in the containers, and therefore he can make much smarter decisions, which is why it's more performant than than before, and which is, but yeah. <laughs> and the, another thing which kind of nice is that the user land is very it's independent. So, the boot to Docker, for instance, uses Tiny Core Linux now. The next version will go to Alpine Linux, um, and you can have any user land you like. At least it has to be Linux, okay? But uh, you can uh, have any Linux uh, user land in uh, different containers, which is also quite nice. And which is, I think, one of the more powerful or one of the, the true powerful things in Linux containers that you can tweak and, and screw with the uh, user land to your needs. This is not really common knowledge now, I think, because everyone is trying to compare the user land of the bare metal installation with the same user land in a container, which is not really smart, I think, because the power is that you can trim down the user land in the container to the full, yeah, to, to, to suit whatever service or whatever task you want to run in the container, mm -hmm. which is really the thing you want to do. So if your bare metal installation uses Red Hat 5, I know that won't work, but mm -hmm. Red Hat 6, and you have a very fresh service that needs the, the newest user land you can get, then this empowers you to use it. I mean, then you, you could mess around with your Red Hat 6 installation or you could use a container, put the user land you need and then off you go. And I showed this a couple of months ago or even years ago, uh, years, it's one and a half years or so, where I used a very fresh Red Hat 7 alpha on the host and then I put uh, Red Hat 6 or CentOS 6 uh, in the container and I run an MPI benchmark, so an HPC workload thing and it was 20% faster in, oh, it was Ubuntu, it was 20% 20 fast, 20 faster in Ubuntu 12 than on Red Hat 7, which was, Red Hat 7 was bare metal, uh, Ubuntu was running in a container. So this showed, <laughs> at least to me, that this is really the real power that you, you gain, that you can tailor, uh, tailor made your, your user land. But I said short, right? So, uh, <laughs> and they are separated by kernel namespaces, and kernel namespaces are just group processes where the the parent process is forked by the kernel or by the by the host, but with special flags so that it uses different namespaces. There is a pit namespace. There are different other namespaces. There's a user namespace I didn't provide because I it's not let's say it's not finished yet or whatnot. I, I haven't used it much. So anyway, it's the five and then there's the sixth. And um, I said the, the group of processes in each container, for instance, here we have like this bash and ls, ls minus l command. They're just grouped and they can be grouped in all the namespaces. And by default, the container will be spawned with uh, his own namespace for, for uh, all, all the namespaces that are only his namespaces. So right, like the right-hand container here. But what you could do as well is you could span 
some namespaces across, so you could create a container and then create another container that uses the name as a network namespace of the first, which is cool. So you could have a sys log agent, for instance, in a container and then create an additional service that hooks into the same namespace of the syslog daemon and then you log to syslog, uh, to, to localhost and you do not need a syslog daemon in your service container anymore because you can just use the syslog of the other container which is pretty cool split of concerns. And once we have the cool pit namespace sharing, namespace sharing, we could even have a service running in container one and then a container that just spins up every 30 seconds to do Nagios checks or whatnot on this mm -hmm. service container and then it's destroyed and then so you could iterate on this uh, namespace container in a minute interval and then every third check will be different anyway. Yeah, but can imagine there's a lot of a lot of uh, fuss you can do. And this is where where the model shoehorning containers into virtual machines completely breaks because, I mean, you c if you talk to people about containers or you used to talk last year or so, they all, yeah, okay, containers I know, it's like virtual VMware. And it, no, it's not because of this, because it will break things. I mean, uh, I asked the question if, uh, well, woo, uh, if, if, you have, if you have physical machines and virtual machines, the paper tray for this in enterprise IT is definitely is the same. So you have like physical machines and then they added a checkbox to the formula for an IP address. And this was just, is it a physical or a virtual machine? But the paper trail doesn't change. And if the paper trail doesn't change, then the processes in the organization doesn't change. And this uh, has to change in this shift now. So containers, different. Anyway, short. And um, But this is also only isolation. So if a container has access to or he, he resides on a system with 12 cores and he can completely use utilize this 12 cores because the uh, namespaces are just separating isolating they are they are not constraining any resource used the restriction is uh, done by c groups so you could tell a container that he's only able to write one megabyte per second on eth0 for instance and then he's only able to and this is also cool because the kernel is in control and he knows about all the c groups of all containers running so he's really in charge and not as in traditional virtualization okay now i will skip through so the docker engine is just the central docker uh, the daemon that creates and removes containers exposes everything right with a restful api yada 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 handles namespace and so on <laughs> and yeah containers are connected to this bridge thing two weeks ago there was a third anniversary of docker so i put this thing here. Docker Compose, as I showed, is just um, a way of describing stacks of different containers. So instead of yeah, instead of writing multiple lines in a bash script that looks like this, you could use a Docker Compose file and I, I really encourage everyone to, to do so because it's a very good way to structure a stack and it's easy put everywhere. And I try to put a Docker, file, a Docker Compose file uh, into each repository of my containers just to provide the means to spin it up which is kind of nice. Then Docker networking is uh, spanning a network across multiple hosts, uses key value store to synchronize. And uh, in, by default, it uses VXLAN, but that's also uh, in the internals. And uh, it's, it's native or it's transparent to the user if he's on the Docker network on multi -ho multiple hosts uh, or on his own boot to Docker image, uh, boot to Docker instance with, without Docker networking or without multiple hosts. And this is what makes it powerful as well, because you do not have to care if you write a compose file, if it's for one node or for multiple nodes, it's kind of cool. Mm -hmm. That it's just um, yeah, transparent to the user. And this is what we really want to provide, right? Tr transparency to the user. And if you have multiple nodes and you want to spin up multiple containers on multiple different nodes, then you can either point your Docker client to multiple Docker engines, but that's boring because you have to know where to start it, right? And this is where, why um, Docker came up with Swarm, where you have one or a set of containers and one Swarm master or multiple Swarm masters, you could have multiple as well. And you then point your Docker client to this uh, Swarm master and he will decide where to put the container. By default, it's pretty simple. He puts it wherever a space and I think uh, he's tried to spread the container uh, out. But you could also, um, uh, yeah, alter or manipulate this decision. So you could say constrain 
I have a constraint. I would like to have this container on node server zero, and then it will be put on server zero. So this is kind of nice. Okay, these two things we can on. Yeah, when I introduce tech, looks like this. Others see it like this. Um, <laughs> we have a lot of buzzwords, which doesn't help. So Docker spans across a lot of, or all of IT, basically. And um, that's where we have all these buzzwords and all these misunderstandings. It's all misunderstandings, right? Yeah, and I will, don't want to use the special distribution, so I give this talk once. Maybe you, you realize this now. Um, uh, because I don't like it. But I don't want to. So I reduce it to the max, service server, yada, yada. Use Docker networking, synchronize it. Yeah, and I think yeah, this I changed. So this is different than before. So now, but I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> OK, so this is the important part. Now I, I calm down. <laughs> because it's an important part. So um, a couple of slides where we where we have to make decisions, or maybe where we where we try to make decisions. And first, we, for instance, in this part, we have, we have to decide where, whether we want to create big images or small images. And when you start, you always create big images. Early, at least I started with big images. So I started to use Fedora and Ubuntu, and I didn't tidy up the packages I install, which is kind of best practice, but or was not best practice half a year ago, I think. So if I installed curl, used it, I didn't re uh, purge it, which mm. um, which is best practice with Alpine, because Alpine is so small, so you don't want to to have packages around that that you don't need anymore. But with, uh, with the older images, I had like images with three gigabytes or so, which is kind of boring if you are at the rural German parts with two megabytes like a bits, like a bits even, uh, internet connection, so you want to have small images. And the same goes if you have a lot of Docker engines run, lingering around, and everyone, if you use Docker Swarm, for instance, you, you pull down or you start an image on one node, and before this image is started on this particular node, it's downloaded by everyone. Because in point of failure, in, in case of failure, it has to be restarted on a different node, so they prefetch everything. So if you have big images and you have a lot of servers, then it's downloaded a couple of times, which is, yeah, which is, um, yeah, it's different. And uh, the question is, do you want to trim down images at all costs? And as I, as I said before, if we have all this cool namespace sharing going around, then we could do really cool stuff like having checks in a different sep uh, container, having performance tests in a different container, and so on, and only have the service that we really desire to run in one container. That would be the goal, and this would be this. So do we want to have one or many service money processes in a container? I, for instance, have at least console, at least supervisor D, uh, or at least supervisor D to start console, to start the service I want to run, and maybe something else, which is also not the religion. The religion is that you have only one process. process. But yeah, as I only, yeah, as I started with this console and supervisor in the container, uh, I am still stuck with many processes. But the best would be only have one process. If this process dies, the container goes down, and then you start a new one. So. Yeah, and as I said here, in reality, is different. And the question is how we want to break with it. Uh, Docker network doesn't make sense here. Um, I think what what really makes sense, and which I talked about in the last talk about scaling down the build pipeline to the essential part that is really needed for the specific project you are in. I think this is that applies for the build pipeline as well, but it applies also for big projects. You want to have the parts scaled down that you can run it on your own laptop, for instance. Or I think that's um, that's that's a given. And if some of you might know OpenFOAM, or maybe not, it's an HPC open source software to run computational fluid dynamics, and it's really ugly to install, or it used to be really ugly. Now there is an Ubuntu package, I think. But if you want to tweak it, then it's really it's complicated. And there are other uh, HPC codes, especially or bioinformatics codes, even worse because bioinformatics they tend to install or iterate very fast and then they use R and then they use some special Python lib library and so on. So you don't want to have this lingering around on your workstation. You want to contain it in a container. This is the essential part. And I think even for the scientific applications, I know I don't know how many sci scientists we have around, but 
if you run a university, you create a paper and you have a special special tool chain you use, what could you better do than putting it in a container because you have a SHA that represents the exact user's, user land you just used and then you can put it in on Docker Hub, you can put the SHA on your, in your paper and then everyone can reproduce what you did. Because this is, I think, that's the most, if you have like in bioinformatics paper from half a year ago, then it's, it's even not possible to recreate what was done because you need a special Ubuntu or whatever. I mean, you can imagine. And I have some talks and some papers or structured documentation about it down there. Yeah, service discovery, I use Consul. I use Consul within the container, which is uh, ugly way. You could use register for, uh, Registrator, for instance, which is outside of the containers. And then he's hooking into the event stream of Docker Engine and listens to when a new container started. And if a new container started, he looks at which ports are exposed, and then he can register it in an external console. It could be also done. I did it, but then I stopped doing it. But the question is how to how to discover different containers on a node. And since they are they are approaching very fast and then they disappear very fast, um, yeah, that's something that has to be figured out. Uh, as I said, the new version of Docker. Uh, engine uh, provides an internal DNS which uh, provides you the means to ping containers across uh, or ping containers from within other containers by just create, uh, using the container name which is nice but they are just called by the network over there yeah no the that's a Docker engine itself that remembers or that, yeah, that provides if, the DNS. If you go with the Docker Compose, as far as I remember, you, you can specify the network over there. Yeah. And they are scoped by the network. So if you specify like a four images, four elements of your Docker Compose, and put them in a different network, yeah, then they they, then they are not. So they need to be in the same network. Yeah, yeah sure. There, yeah? Sure. But you can you can attach containers to multiple networks. So yeah, 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 yeah. So and, and within the network they can discover each other, but they can mm -hmm. only discover the host name and not the not, not, not the service name. But as I said, if you have only if you have one <coughs> process per container, then you most likely have only one service per container. Yeah. And if you have like a MySQL container, then you just call the MySQL container MySQL, and then you can yeah, well, the ping the they name. are on the standard port, yeah. 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 And you don't know about the port. Yeah. And with console, you even know the port. Yeah. So I, I think I would stick to console for a couple of more months maybe, but yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, orchestration frameworks, so you could have, you could, I, I think Swarm is the best thing because it's very flexible and it's very simple and you, you, you look at it and you know what it's doing. Um, and you could even run Kubernetes and Mesos on top of Swarm so you don't, you don't lose any flexibility if you use Swarm, but that's just me. <laughs> and then uh, also controversial is um, since we, or you should have, or tend, or you should, go towards uh, immutable containers. So you don't want to mess around with the internals of a container, just going and changing configuration or so. That's, that's not good because you want to reason about the container by looking at the SHA of the image, right? You, you, you don't want to mess around with the configuration uh, by hand and then say, oh, I, I changed this, um, this container uh, the last half year five times and then no one, no one knows what, what, is, what was done. And this is a pets versus cattle thing uh, all over again, right? So the question is, do we need container or conflict management anymore? I think we don't. Build management, maybe. So easy build, for instance, for building images, maybe. But uh, configuration management, I think it's. Uh, I don't. I won't buy any uh, any shares in, in this company. Yeah, I said that too. But often you have some really pet application and which. Ages to run, or if you think about this, uh, distributed databases which you probably don't want to restart if you just want to change the not so important config value or something yeah, like I that. Yeah, I mean, I mean, that's exaggerated what I say, but um, I think the configuration management pie is it's it's baked, it's not growing anymore, so I think that's not a market where you can you could see you, you will see much more growth because. The artifact hopefully will be a Docker image, and the Docker image will have a deterministic um, way of, of reacting to configuration, like an environment variable where you specify if it's a prod or if it's uh, staging or if it's what environment you choose. And then 
whatever you put in the environment variable will trigger a configuration pass within the container. So you will have a deterministic um, outcome of the container. I think that's most likely. I mean, you, you don't want to run Ansible within the container. And, and yeah, I mean, if someone thinks it's a good idea, he is happy to do so. It's a free word, but I think um, you want to have a Docker Compose file that uh, the Docker file that has multiple stages. So you don't want to run from Ansible and then do Ansible playbook and install some stuff with only one step within a Docker Compose uh, Docker file because mm -hmm. you don't you lose all the layering and you lose all the the explicit. Yeah, the explicit notion of the Docker file if you have like multiple steps, right? So if you install MySQL and then Apache and then configure it, you know exactly by looking at the Docker file what's going on. But I think that's that's <coughs> going to be a discussion and um, yeah, continuous delivery integration. We talked about it, and uh, that's very in the extra regulation. But I, I like to tease the HPC community, so I I put these slides on. So. The Docker Momentum, I think, in my opinion, was first sparked by this IT tinkering guys, the hello world of all, of all kinds, where you have a piece of software and you want to, to, to tinker around with it, and this is easy to run with Docker. <coughs> and this goes from small to big projects, I think. And with this comes the easy, the boost of continuous uh, development and deployment and all we talked about today. Um, where you could easily automate all the things because it was very fast or is very fast and very um, reliable and reproducible. So this goes there as well. And hyper, uh, microservices, hyperscale, I mean, you have to put these passwords in. Um, with this continuous integration, it was easy to scale and easy to automate as well. So this goes complex in software, but also complex in uh, data center operations. And that's where we got Kubernetes and Mesos and so on which um, are, I think, nice ways of um, deploying services. But in my previous work and my hobby, <laughs> HPC, it's not about services, it's about tasks. So I think that's kind of different, but that's, that's um, another way uh, or another, another topic entirely. Um, so, and then big data, I think that's also like this big data and this complex workloads where you, where you could deploy this very easily now. Uh, having SAMHSA in a, in, a, uh, in a container, for instance, pretty nice. But HPC jumped like this. And this was nice, I think. Okay. And I think that's because there are different kinds of IT infrastructures or IT um, yeah, religions or, or ways of doing IT. I think software development was, was very boosted by the fact that it, it's like um, you can create a production-like environment to tinker around with stuff. So if you need Python 2.7 or on MongoDB and Postgres and Memcache, you can create it with a Docker file and spin it up and then develop on your laptop very fast. So you do not have to install everything. Mm -hmm. And I think it's kind of like Python's virtual env on steroids. I mean, do you, the guys who use virtual env knows that you, you can easily recreate your Python environment with this. I never I didn't use it much, but now we have Docker containers, and Docker containers are, I think, just an iteration on this because you, you can just spin up the stack you need very easily and then develop only the piece of code you want to develop and you do not have to care about how to how do I install Elasticsearch, how do I install MongoDB and so on. So it's pretty easy. And in HPC, it's a little bit different. So HPC, it's like, uh, it's, um, yeah, compute, computing weather predictions or computing colliding uh, uh, colliding black holes or whatever, so big problems. And um, in Docker, uh, in HPC, it's, it's more that you do not focus on the software development that much, but you rather focus on uh, the iteration on input or on configuration, right? So you have you, the, the German target show, for instance, they do not develop on uh, the, the, the software for the prediction all the time. They're just tinkering around with the input and the configuration. Right? And you need uh, a distributed system for most of the problems because they're big. And this, I think, is my take why the Docker is, hasn't gained much in HPC because it's not about software development. It's rather settings and input data. And when you go from single 
single laptops where you can use Docker Compose and Docker very easily to uh, single machines like a workstation or a server with one just one server, then it's pretty easy to scale your software development or iterate on your input. But if you want to deploy it on uh, one big machine, for instance, this is Pete's Dean Dante, or uh, I visited it, but I don't remember the name, but it's the fastest PC in Europe. It's a lot of machines, and you cannot run distributed jobs fairly easy with Docker now, or at least mm -hmm. there are some problems. So that's why I think we as an HPC community, and we don't, so you are not so. Anyway, but this was a take of the, of the talk, that there is a barrier that we have to reach. Anyway, and there, there are some tools to work around, but still something to, to think of. And container, uh, Docker Engine 111 will be uh, implementing container D, where you can specify the, um, the runtime you want to use. And if you choose run C, for instance, then you can spin up Docker Engine, spin up a container, which will be uh, spun up via run C. And then you can kill the daemon. <coughs> he's not the parent of the of the container, and this is one of the big concerns about Docker that you have a daemon that has to run all the time, and when it's dying, then everything is falling apart. And with this, that's not the case anymore. So you can, and this is even uh, pluggable. So you could have run C. You could even, I think, you can even use Rocket, maybe. But yeah, mm -hmm. so just. Um, yeah, and I recap that um, we have this momentum. Oh, we don't want to, or, and this applies to all everything or every environment. I think what you want to do with Docker and what's very cool to do is to em empower the developers to be very fast on the iteration cycles. So they can easily spin up the stack they need and then they, they just go crazy on their uh, iterations because they can iterate every day or every hour or whatnot. But, uh, and I think that <clears throat> it would it's cool to use a vanilla tag of Docker because it provides everything I, I need. I mean, maybe different for others. And uh, having kibitz on the radar, but don't bother too much. That's the same like with this Docker daemon uh, problem that it's a daemon. So now with 111, this thing is vanished. And the same goes for, I think, user um, namespaces and pit namespaces will roll out a lot of uh, problems that we face today and that's why I don't bother too long with problems because um, they there's so much so fast moving if you think about it half a year and then come out of the woods and say okay yeah uh, now I have the solution for everything and then they say yeah okay you are here and we are there so <laughs> it makes no sense yeah that's <coughs> the fast go through <laughs> the slides yeah, so that's what I think uh, that's kind of a nice, uh, hopefully f kind of an interesting go through all the problems, I think, because that's what everyone asks anyway. If you talk about Docker in your uh, organization, then they say, yeah, but, and then you say, yeah, but, <laughs> I don't know, yeah. just my take. Okay.